people that live here. But something that I think y'all consider just like second nature, but is now coming to fruition for us, is the more organic and the natural wines that are, you know, yeah. macerated and then you know they're doing second fermentations in the bottle and you're seeing crystallizations yeah. under the cork. It's great to see it. Like you know, I didn't really, it wasn't on the radar, so to speak. You know, it's yeah. oftentimes, but. It seems like this is kind of – that's all you all have known. What is the kind of the trend where you all are going right now? Uh, right now, the trend in Bordeaux has changed a lot. And that, that, that I brought you a, a 2016 wine, which is fantastic. rather young. This wine will be fantastic in 30 years. You have cycles in wine. Uh, at the beginning, the wine is all about what the, the, the winery makes it. So it's, it's like man-made. Men uh, after a while, the wine starts moving towards the earth. So in 30 years, this wine will be very different than what we t taste now. Uh, people today, the trend um, today is the fact that uh, people start enjoying more and more younger wine uh, because it's, it's, it's not as sophisticated and you don't need to learn more about, much about wine in order to enjoy it. Uh, when I was growing up, the older the wine, the better it was. Whereas today, it's true that older wine, because they, they, they come back towards the earth uh, and towards what you know, made them, um, they are sophisticated, and it's true they have different tastes. We were talking about the fact that you can tell about berries, you can take about, talk about licorice when you smell this wine. Uh, when they grow older, they have totally different um, smell and totally different uh, um, flavor. And, 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 and that's why it's interesting to see that now but I think it's it's because a lot of wine comes from new countries, as I mentioned, Chile and Australia and everything, and all these wines, they can't age. So people are getting more and more used of younger um, uh, wines, and that's, that's the trend we see, at least in Bordeaux. Yeah, so the new worlds are coming around in the younger ages? Okay, right. because we've seen those kind of... We've heard about these kinds of things where they're grown at higher altitudes, so they can't have, they don't have the luxury of Correct. letting those things sit around. But it's also Correct. a very seasonal grape, you know, yep. based off of it. So that's always fun to see what's trending in other places. So while we kind of, and I still think I associate age with higher quality because it's the same reason. Yeah, let chili sit an, an extra day over. You know, lets the flavors marry in the pot yep. together, and they kind of come together. So that I've always associated the elder age with a, either higher price point or higher sophisticated wines. So it's yeah, nice definitely for we're some. We're trendy in Bordeaux. Yeah. Chris. For some wines, you definitely want age. Others are others are okay, young and stuff. But that's this exactly. one, yeah. So this wine, that that that's why I mean. You can search about uh, Omar Buzet, and you'll, you'll find it's one of the top, top one we have now in Bordeaux. And the beauty of this wine is that even the 2018, 2019, which is just made in bottles, are fantastic. But again, I just opened in 1966 for my birthday back in April, you know, so 55 years old, and the wine was just outstanding. Right. When so you get home, I'm gonna need you to ship me one of those. 70s. <laughs> so ship me a I can't ship them. If you have you, to what is your in the U.S.? <laughs> like, your, I'll, I'll bring them in my suitcase. So I'll invite I'll, me again, and I'll come back. My <laughs> friend, my friend, I'm coming. I'll do you one oh, better. Come, I'm okay. coming back okay. with you. Great. Uh, we'll just do. It. We're gonna do a home and home. I'm okay. Come that's to, to that's great. <laughs> so so do you do you visit these wineries quite a bit oh, when yeah, you're yeah, over yeah. there regularly? Regularly, like weekly, huh? I mean, it's your not, family not stuff. weekly, but at least once a month, definitely. I mean, I go see my father, my godfather. Uh, also, we also have very good friends in Ch with Chateau Lynchbach, which is also a very, very nice one. The Poyac, this one is a Saint Estef, which is another region of of Bordeaux, and Poyac also in Chateau Lynchbach is one of the one of the top. And so we have very good friend who's uh, who's who owns there. There are four kids who own actually Chateau Lynchbach, and one of them is one of very good friend. And so we go there regularly. No, I mean, it's, it's part of our lives, and, you know, I live, like, half an hour away from, from the chateaus. So when, like, growing up it, and stuff, as, as part of this Bordeaux life, uh, like, what were, what were some, like, memorable meals you had? Or what's your, what's your classic French, French dinner that you want to have with friends? Well, no, the memories that I could tell you is that when I was at university, um, you know, a, a professor would call in sick or whatever, and so we would get stuck, and all my friends would come to me and say, can you take us to one of the chateaux? And so we would spend the day drinking and my godfather's favorite game was to get me a bit drunk <laughs> like very drunk that's a good that's a good and grandfather call my dad I love this and guy. say i just saw i just saw your son 
uh, and he came out of my chateau. He was he couldn't stand up anymore. <laughs> I was like 18 or 19, and uh, that, so that that's we had fantastic memories of that with with very good friends from university, and we used to spend a lot of time going from university to the chateau. So yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's some fun stories. <laughs> How big is your personal wine cellar at home? Well, it's pretty big. <laughs> How many it's bottles pretty. do you have in there? Uh, I have two fridges because today it's, that's another trend that normally in Bordeaux, because Bordeaux houses are, were built in 1850, and they are <laughs> stones um, built in stone, so it, like, they, they get really uh, cool mm-hmm. all year you'll long. You'll keep them in like the basement. And you'll keep them in the basement. And we used to have uh, uh, cellars that used to go down quite, uh, quite a lot. Uh, but really, the best way to keep them is, is with fridges, the, the new fridges that they, they have, you know, because you have humidity and, and temperature and all this. Uh, uh, so and I have, you can I keep have two those of things at like four different ranges, you know, oh with yeah, the refrigerators absolutely. now. Like absolutely. mine's a one, but my buddy has one that's two, and so he keeps his whites on, you know, like one side of the rack, and then yep. you know the yep, other absolutely. ones, everything else. And so uh, with between the two, I probably have uh, 700, 800 bottles, but I have also a lot of bottles. In the chateaus, because the way you do it in Bordeaux is you buy your wine as the, uh, what we call in primeur, which is before they are put in bar- or even in a barrel. You buy like the vintage. So you, buy, you know, for example, Omar Bizet, I know it's going to be good because they never have a bad year. Or Lynch Bash, same thing. So, you know, like the 2022, 20, I've already bought like 10 or 20 cases. I can't remember exactly how many. Uh, and they'll be delivered to me in 2025. But I've already spent the money, and so yeah. that helps also the chateaus because obviously they have good, um, you know, cash uh, situation. And uh, and for me, I every year I get all my bottles coming from three or four years before I I, uh, I actually um, uh, can drink them. So this wine, the 2016, I probably got it uh, last year or the year before, you know. But uh, so I have a lot in my own cellars, and I also have a lot in the in the chateaus. Waiting for me. God, that is so. I'm definitely coming to visit. You yeah, have, anytime. Actually, anytime. Oh, yeah. 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 That's on air. My friend. Yeah, I know, know I'm recorded. <laughs> I'll be like knocking on the door, but like I'm just playing it like the kid uh, John Cusack from whatever movie <laughs> that is. Say anything. So um, so nowadays, uh, since you you've settled back down in France after yeah. living in the U.S. for quite some time, um, where are you? Kind of consulting now? Yes, or? exactly. You know, when over besides 50, 50, being an author, <laughs> yeah. Besides being an author, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm consulting and uh, and I'm also an influencer on new technologies. Uh, so I do a lot of influence campaigns uh, with Amazon is one of my biggest customer. NG also, which is an energy European energy company, uh, so I help them a lot getting you know anytime they have a new offer or things like that. And Amazon, I do Amazon Academy, I do Carrier. Days I do uh, Prime Days I do a, a lot of things for them. What's the newest technology way we need to get on? I work in software as a service. Oh, yeah. um, I we I sell interactive voice recognition software and we use Amazon Web Service layers yeah. and we've created our own backend. Please tell me so I can take this to my <laughs> boss and maybe save this job. Yeah. Now AWS is is honestly the best uh, cloud services you can find on the yeah, market. Yeah, I could so. more. So I did that, uh, you know, and uh, and so I work a lot with AWS as well. And, you know, I, I know all the others. I know Microsoft Azure. I know uh, Google, obviously. We used IBM uh, Watson for a little time. Watson, we Watson was great, but IBM sold Watson. So uh, it's an Yeah, I don't, I don't think that's why. That yeah. may be why we don't anymore. In healthcare, don't in healthcare IBM is, is very good. But anyway, the, the trends today, what, what you see more and more is robotics uh, coming with uh, AI uh, as a service. And that, to me, is, is the future of everything. Because not every company can afford to have data scientists, uh, can afford to have so uh, you know uh, the whole infrastructure around AI. Um, so uh, uh, low code, no code type of applications are extremely um, uh, important, uh, and uh, and also uh, anything around AI as a service, meaning you only buy what you need for in terms of algorithms for your AI applications. So these two, to me, are – you can see it everywhere anyway. I mean, I'm not – you know, you ask anybody who's involved in new technologies today, that's probably what they'll tell you. But that's why I see more and more with all the, all the projects I have. No, I agree wholeheartedly. And so my follow-up question to that is, how long do we have on Earth before the robots take over? 
the robots will never take over. They are programmed by men. Uh, yeah, that's what you, yeah, you say that that's now. The, yeah, we've all seen no. Eagle Eye with Shia LaBeouf. We know that if the computer... <laughs> Systems go rogue. What happens when someone builds an army of Boston scientific robots that goes and starts shooting up third world countries that can't defend them? So. Yeah, I know. That's, uh, you, we've you already that started doing it from the air, technically, the Americans. Yeah, with but, drones. You're, you're right, but... Today, um, and, and you're right, you can have some countries, and I won't name them, but yes, you, could, you, could, you have some countries today that could develop that, those technologies. And that's why it's really important that the UN plays a role in terms of ethics. In my book, I, there's a whole chapter about AI and ethics. Let's talk a little uh, bit more about the book. <laughs> yeah, I want to I talk, but no, but that, that's essential. I actually start the book with a, a, a sentence coming from the 14th century from a French philosopher. Um, and says science without conscience is ruin of the of the spirit. So it's basically saying you need to have conscience in order to to progress. Uh, but we've seen that you know it's not some it's not a revolution. It's not something that we see today. Uh, when the telephone was invented, you had people who said, "Oh no, it's evil." You know, people can listen to what we're saying and everything. Of course they can, of course. But you know, we we have rules. We have laws we have and, and but again you know i'm not naive and i know that some countries like we, north korea and things like that we are. could could potentially build some some things but again in order to do that you need to have money you need to have great universities and you know just the combination of those two you get you find them in america in countries that are potentially Ethical, you know, technically is what you were re- referencing, like I mean, having ethics? I, I, was, I mean, the North Koreans, I, I don't think they're listening to this podcast. I mean, because <laughs> if we had a reach there, I'd be very impressed. But we can say that. Right, like, no, you're absolutely right. But, you know, Europe, U.S., uh, I mean, all, all the – Japan, Korea, South Korea, all, all these countries, these guys, they, they have ethics. They, they, are, they, they, they trust U.N. They, 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 they follow U.N. recommendations and things like that. And that – that's the reason why I actually wrote the book, not only to explain the the the, the, the luck because it was I was very lucky in my life, uh, but also to explain that to people do not be scared of new technologies. Technology to me is about human augmented, and that's the term that I use over and over in the book. It's like I want to see robots to help people to do things more interesting. For example, if you cash register at uh, any uh, Safeway. Uh, sorry, that's the only no, one I know. No, I don't no, know if you have no. Safeways in, in, in Colorado, but uh, in California we have plenty of them. Yeah, we have uh, plenty of Safeways. But, but you, you have, uh, you know, and, and there's nothing more um, mundane than scanning uh, articles one after the other. If you, and, and that's why it's really important is your, your manager or the owner of the Safeway needs to invest in you in order for you, for robots to replace you behind the cash register and invest in the person who was a behind the cash register to do something more interesting. And that's why I'm saying do not be scared of new technology, but in the meantime, let's ensure that ethics and, and people get um, also play their, their role in uh, ensuring that people who are being replaced, if I quote unquote, then they can also do something more interesting, you know, They're uh, being instead. repurposed instead of replaced. Exactly. And it's about, all about transformation. So we're talking a lot about digital transformation these days, and it's not only about digital, the transformation, it's also about mindset, a change of mindset. And that's why I wrote this book, is really to make sure that people, and that's, I wrote it, I have, um, because I have a French version, and it was very successful, that's why I decided to do the, the English version. And uh, I have kids, like seven, eight years old, who read the book. I also have older people, like 70, 75, say, well, we understand everything. I really did it so at least people... Because today you talk about blockchain, and there's a whole paragraph about a oh, chapter about blockchain, you know, and people are thinking, oh, what's blockchain, and uh, should we be worried about blockchain and things like that? And I explain, you know, I explain about big data, and the way I explain big data, I explain like uh, like a recipe, you know, you know where, where where you decide to to bake a cake, you know where your flour is, you know where your sugar is, you know where so, and it's exactly the same thing with big data. You organize your data so you know where to get the information you need. And, and that's why I wanted to, to write this book, is to make sure that people are not scared of 5G. In Europe, people think that when you get the COVID vaccine, you also get the 5G uh, chip inside you, so Big Brother can check what you do. I mean, it's insane. In, in the UK, they are burning 5G masts because they are convinced that uh, 5G uh, sends a COVID virus to everyone, 
right? So, I mean, as the CDC, we have, I mean, the mask mandate just pops up on the television in the back of the screen. It's like we've had this misinformation.